Hey there, I'm Ari from the Tech Buyers Guru and I've got another PC Build Buyers Guide for you here on the channel. Today, this time around, I'm showcasing my $1,000 Mini iTex Gaming PC for fall of 2020. Now, I call it a gaming PC, but frankly, it's a do-anything PC and I'm actually building this up specifically for the Zwift Cycling app. So for you who are not familiar with it, it is an app that allows you to hook up a stationary trainer with a road bike or any other type of bike and participate in virtual races with real people all around the world. And this is becoming immensely popular these days now that we can't go to the gym or we can't go outside. We wanna get our exercise in and we wanna do it in an interesting and exciting way. And the Zwift Cycling app allows you to do that because it presents you with all sorts of environments and really cool terrains. And really it uses a pretty sophisticated graphics engine, not unlike a game, to draw you into that world and make you feel like you're really in a race with other people in other places, places you haven't been, but places that look really interesting and keep you motivated to push yourself to the extreme. And that's the idea behind this PC. Like I said, you can do a lot of things on it, but I've actually tailored it so that it really does allow you to max out that Zwift cycling app. And I'll be talking about it and actually showcasing it in use later in this video. But first, I'll step through all the parts I've selected here and I'll highlight a couple of the build steps just so you can kind of get going and don't get tripped up on the tricky stuff. And I will mention that this does target a $1,000 uh, price range, but I've made a couple select upgrades because I have a few other things in mind. So there are a couple parts here that are a little bit more expensive than you need for the Zwift cycling app, but you may want to use them if you are using other gaming apps or you have other content creation in mind. So specifically, I have an upgraded motherboard, slightly upgraded video card, and I also have an optional CPU cooler on here just to keep it a little quieter. Although the CPU itself, this Core i5 over here, does actually come with a cooler in the box. So I'll just highlight all the things that I've done optionally to this build, but I'll also note what you need to buy if you want to keep that budget around a thousand dollars so without further ado let me crack open these boxes show you the parts that are going to be going inside this case and then we'll build up the system in this buyer's guide i will be going into detail on the assembly under the assumption that some of you may be new to the process here's the motherboard box and note it comes with two little screws one of which we will definitely be using so don't lose track of those here's the manual that includes a cd which we will not be using since the system has no cd drive Here's the I.O. panel. We can't forget to install that before we install the motherboard. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Here's some cables, which thankfully we don't need to use since we're using a modern M.2 drive. And here are the Wi-Fi antennas, which we'll be installing at the end of the process. Now I'll show you the motherboard. Take note that I'm using a Z490 motherboard, but for most people, I recommend the H470 version, which simply eliminates overclocking. Now here's that M.2 drive. It's extremely modern. This is a PCIe-based model. It's very fast. It fits into a slot on the motherboard underneath this heatsink. I just remove it and then slip the drive into the mount. Take note that I'll have to make sure I have those screws handy once I get that into the slot because it does not stay put otherwise. You'll see it kind of just flops up like that. So here's that tiny screw that came with the motherboard. I hate these screws personally because I always drop them and then I have to try to reposition them, but I finally got it here wrangled in and now I can put that heatsink on, but take note, it has some plastic that you need to remove in order to enable the thermal transfer. So make sure you remove that piece of plastic before you screw down the heatsink. Now our SSD is installed. It was that simple. I really love these M.2 drives. Next step, we'll take a look at the CPU. This is an Intel Core i5-10400. Note that it uses the LGA-1200 socket. It's really important that you match that with your motherboard. And if you're using the H470 or Z490 motherboard that I'm using here, it will work. This socket looks exactly the same as many other past sockets, but the CPU will not fit in older sockets. Note that the CPU has notches on either side of it which need to be lined up with the tabs in the socket. So you can see these tabs right here. And then I just gently lay the CPU down. The scariest part of any Intel CPU installation is lowering this lid and locking it into place. You actually just slip it under that tab and lower this locking mechanism, which does require some force. And then that black lid will actually pop off and you can discard that or put it in your motherboard box for storage. Here's the CPU cooler. I'm actually not going to use this one, but it's actually quite simple to use. It's included with the CPU. You just press the tabs in and then turn these knobs to lock it in place. But I'm actually going to be using an aftermarket cooler, which provides lower temperatures and lower noise. This is a 58 millimeter tall model from Silverstone called the AR06. It's as tall 
a CPU cooler as you can use with this system. I really like this heatsink because it does fit in the same footprint as the Intel cooler. You can see here it's about the same size width wise, but it offers a lot more cooling capacity thanks to its much more substantial heatsink material. Now I'll go ahead and show you how it installs. Note that I have my CPU upside down here, and that's because that's how it will sit in the case. And I want the CPU cooler to be mounted in a particular way with these heat pipes at the bottom, these loops here. They should face the bottom for maximum efficiency. Now here are the brackets that you attach to the cooler, and I have to screw in these screws here and manually tighten them on using little nuts that are included in the kit. So I'll go ahead and do that and then attach them to the heatsink. Now the heatsink assembly is complete and I'm ready to mount this on the motherboard. It looks good. Just going to check the fan to make sure it's spinning. It is. Let's go ahead with the thermal paste. This is more art than science. Some people say use a pea-sized application, which is about right for an Intel CPU. Now I'll lower the heatsink into place, double checking that I have it in the right orientation. Note that I had to attach the fan here because it would otherwise be blocked by that heat pipe once it's locked into place. Here I flipped the motherboard over to give me easy access to the screws. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this installation before the motherboard's in the case. Note that the cooler comes with these little rubber insulating stickers. I actually recommend that you attach them to the screws rather than to the motherboard as suggested in the manual. It's just easier to get them in place. Now I just screw these in by hand and then finally tighten them down with my screwdriver. Making sure that I apply equal pressure on all corners by going from side to side and corner to corner a few turns at a time until the CPU heatsink is locked in place. It's a really nice fit on this motherboard and now it's time to install the RAM. Now I'm using Crucial Ballistics here and I do recommend it for this build. It's a good price. And the process of installing it seems self-explanatory, but unfortunately it is a little bit tricky. This is actually the number one reason that people's PC builds won't boot. First, I unlock these tabs and lower the RAM into place. You would think that it goes in easily, but unfortunately DDR4 RAM is designed so that the fit is extremely tight. And that means even though I know what I'm doing and I'm familiar with this process, I am not pressing hard enough yet to get this to lock in. And the reason I'm spending so much time demonstrating this to you is to show you that even someone who knows what they're doing can make this mistake. Note that those tabs have not locked in yet. So just take your time and double check the insertion of your RAM pressing on both sides like I'm doing here until you hear the click and you see those tabs lock in. Once you're confident that those tabs have locked in, it's time to move on to the next step. And for this step, we'll actually have to have a little bit more space in front of us as we will have the case out. Here I've removed one of the side panels to reveal the motherboard and power supply compartment. The first step will actually be to install this IO panel because if I forget it now, I can't install it later. You just press it into place, making sure it's fully inserted so it doesn't block your motherboard, which I am installing here. Make sure to line up all the ports with the holes and you'll have no problem getting the motherboard into place. This bag of screws comes with the case and I do suggest you take a look at the manual to familiarize yourself with the various screws that are included so you use the right ones for the motherboard as I'm using here. Once you've affixed all four corners it's time to move on to this cool contraption which is the PCI riser card. This allows you to flip the orientation of your GPU as is done in this case. So the only thing we'll do in this first step is actually to insert the riser card's first part into the motherboard. This is really, really simple. Just press it into the slot. It fits very nicely. And we will secure it later on using two screws in these two posts and then insert this section when we do flip the case over. Now it's time to connect the front port cables to the motherboard. So these are all the ports on the front of your case as well as the power button. The first cable I will attach is called the HD audio cable that powers your headphone and microphone jacks in the front of the case and they connect to a header in the lower left corner of the motherboard. Then I have this thick cable that's the USB 3.0 cable for my front ports on the case. This cable is hard to miss given how large it is that also means it's a little bit hard to hide inside of your case which I'm trying to do here. Next up are the power switch, reset switch, and front LED cables. These connect to a compound header, which unfortunately is not that user-friendly and is kind of a relic from the previous century. 
I do recommend that you consult the manual if you have any trouble reading the silk screening on the motherboard, which indicates which set of pins is for which of the connectors. Next up comes the power supply installation. I'm recommending the Silverstone SX500G. It's an excellent power supply that's quiet, efficient, and modular. Note that it includes these screws, which I will use to affix it to the case in a moment, so don't lose track of those. You only need this power cable, the motherboard cable, then the PCIe cable, which is blue coated, and then finally the CPU cable, which is actually a split cable. Technically, it's a four plus four pin cable, but you are using both sides. These in the power supply are all you need for this system, which is why I really like to go modular with my builds. The power supply slips in very neatly into this case. The case can actually fit longer power supplies, but I really like using the smallest power supply that has sufficient power. Here I attach the pigtail, and then I get the bag of screws included with the power supply and affix it to the case. The next step is optional. There's actually this included brace with the case to ensure that your power supply doesn't move during transport. You simply use two screws to secure it in place. Next up, I attach those modular cables that I mentioned. This is the CPU cable, so you will just want to read the legend on the back of the power supply to know where to attach your cables. Next up will be the PCIe cable, which is noted in blue here on the power supply and on the cable, which makes it quite handy. And then finally, I use the big 24-pin motherboard cable. Note that Silverstone's version of this actually has a split end and has a four pin auxiliary sense cable that you need to plug into this receptacle here. And then the 24 pin of course goes into the largest receptacle on the power supply. Of course, each of those power cables needs to be connected somewhere. And here is the four plus four pin CPU cable in the corner, a little bit hard to reach, but I can get it in. And then once all the cables are connected and tied down, it's a pretty neat build, plenty of space for everything. And in case you're wondering, those two trays there are for old 2.5 inch drives, if you have any. Now it's time to install the GeForce RTX 2060 KO that goes on the other side of the case. And if you'll recall, I did install half of the riser card previously. Now I have to screw it down and then I will remove this bracket to allow me to install the video card. I recommend you now insert the video card into the other half of the riser card and then that goes into the slot down at the bottom of the case here. Make sure to line it up with the back panel and everything will be good to go. The last step will be to secure the video card and then connect the power cable. Note that this is a split six plus two pin cable and you do need to use the full connector. So please put these two ends together and then insert it into the video card. Note that this system does have space for a much larger video card should you want to upgrade in the future. Now here's a pro tip, don't forget to flip the switch on your power supply so that when you actually hit the power button, it turns on, which it has done here. My system's actually fully functional at this point. All I have to do is close up the panels and get my software loaded. So the panels go on with just a little bit of a challenge. You just have to line up all the tabs correctly and then affix it with three screws for each of the two panels. And don't forget the handle. This is one of the really cool features of the ML08H case. H is for handle. And then it's time to attach my Wi-Fi antennas, which came with the motherboard. Don't forget to attach those, otherwise your motherboard's Wi-Fi reception won't be very good. One more pro tip. There are actually two sets of video connectors on this system. Only use the ones on your video card or you won't get video output. Now, once you have Windows 10 installed from the USB drive, which is fairly self-explanatory, you'll need to download some motherboard drivers. And I've highlighted the drivers that you really should get from the ASRock site for your H470 or Z490 board. These are gonna be pretty similar regardless of the manufacturer you're using. And now for the fun part, using your apps. Here's the Zwift app that a lot of you at home cyclists are using and I'm highlighting the changes to the graphics settings that you should do. First, the screen mode should be full screen and then you can take advantage of the 4K UHD or Ultra HD mode. And in case you're interested in what that gets you versus the lowest quality mode, notice how choppy those lines on the road are and how individuals in the distance are hard to see. Even this blimp is really jagged. Now I'm gonna switch it to 1080p mode, which most laptops can actually handle. It's okay, but it's still a little bit ragged and jagged. I don't love the look of this. And if you're staring at this for hours while exercising, you'll be pretty annoyed at all the aliasing on your own character. Then I'll show you the 1440p or ultra mode. Note that these are accessible regardless of the actual resolution 
of your monitor. Here it's better, but I still see some jaggies on these road lines, and even my character model is a little bit jagged. And when you're staring at it for hours while exercising, that could get annoying. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip over to the 4K mode, which is really just shorthand for the best setting. You can use this on any monitor. It's called 4K UHD. I'm actually not even running this on a 4K monitor, but it looks fantastic. The road stripes are really straight, no jaggies. The characters look crisp. While objects in the distance like this tree still have some jaggies, my character model and bike are very, very smooth and crisp. And that's what you're gonna be looking at a lot while you're exercising. Now to give you a sense of what various video cards can achieve, I've benchmarked three here in the maximum 4K preset. Note that the RTX 2060 I used is really more powerful than necessary given that most monitors max out at 60 hertz. So really I'm aiming for 60 frames per second and I think your best bet is the GTX 1660 Super. Now my wife will demonstrate how the Zwift app interfaces with the Wahoo Kicker Smart Trainer to allow you to exercise at home versus people all over the world. Now here's the PC we just built for this purpose, and I'll show you what the app looks like in practice. It's a really good looking app and really draws you into the world as you cycle against people. Note that I do have it locked at 60 frames per second, and that means it's not taxing my video card all that much and still looks really good on this 60 hertz monitor. Now one thing that's a shame is that the Zwift app doesn't allow you to access the highest quality preset unless it deems your system capable of it. And any computer using built-in graphics will be limited to that 1080 preset. This 4K preset looks a whole lot better and I think a lot of people would probably enjoy the upgrade if they are gonna use the Zwift app quite a bit for their at-home cycling routine. Note that the Zwift app does have a $15 per month subscription fee and this Wahoo Kicker Snap Trainer costs $500. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this buyer's guide. This is a PC I'm really excited about because it does so many things so well. It's affordable and it's portable. And of course, as I mentioned, that Zwift app is a really neat application of a high powered PC that still doesn't cost an arm and a leg. For around $1,000, you can max out that app and really get involved in virtual racing and virtual exercise in a way that was hard to do previously. I find it really an exciting application of PC power. Of course, if you have any questions, please post them down below. I'll do my best to respond. If you've enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and subscribe, and I will catch you next time.